today, and we can leave these names on the screen for just a minute, uh, but this is our second session in our writer's workshop. And so thank you all for being with us again. But last week, we spent a good portion of our time talking about pursuing fruitfulness in the training. Um, and so as we just heard from some of our friends, um, that included um, the importance of a multiplication, multiplying a training, um, multiplying, um, going wide in training, but also going deep in training. Uh, we talked about how we want the training that we write to produce fruit, that we're not simply writing training for the sake of writing, that we are going um, after this with the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to guide us, to fill us, um, to just breathe over every part of our training development, um, knowing that God has called us in the pursuit of fruitfulness, has called us to do our part and to do our part as best as we can, but also to trust him, knowing that only God can bring the fruit and change lives. And so let's just pause here and give our time today to the Lord, invite the Holy Spirit um, to be with us and to continue to equip us as we pursue um, being writers who write fruitful training. All right, Lord, thank you so much uh, for my dear friends from around the world, um, for their heart and their love and their passion for you, um, their passion to see the next generation following you and serving you, their passion, Lord, for training and equipping and uh, and multiplying themselves for this great work. And Lord, for as much as we love the children of the world, God, we know that it's, it's nothing in comparison to the love that you have for them, to the love that you have for their families, their communities. And so Lord, we just offer ourselves um, today to be a part of this work that you are doing. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us new insights and understanding. Um, help us to walk away with new ideas and new skills. Lord, um, as we think about today being Valentine's Day, um, but also being the beginning of the, the Lenten season, Ash Wednesday, we are reminded of your great love shown to us through Jesus. Would you help us today to be equipped to share that love more fully with others in Jesus' name? Amen. So I want to start uh, today with a story. I want you to imagine this scenario with me. So a trainer is invited by a local church to lead a training on youth ministry. And the trainer is really excited because he has been learning about youth ministry um, in his master degree classes. He's been studying how youth learn, how they think, how they grow, how they develop, um, mostly between the age of 13 and 19. He's also been learning about psychology of youth and how they interact with each other in social settings. So he is preparing a training for this church that is full of rich theology and psychology and sociology um, and all the different parts of youth development. The church who's going to be receiving this training, they are really excited because they currently do not have a youth ministry, um, but they know that they, they need one and they want to start a youth ministry in their church. They simply don't know where to begin, so they are looking forward to some practical next steps that they can take to start a youth ministry in their church. So on the day of the training, both the trainer and the participants are really excited. But as the half-day training goes on, and the trainer talks about psychology, and he talks about youth development, and he talks about all the different ways that you are wired to grow and to interact with each other. The participants become less and less excited and less and less engaged. 
And by the end of the training, both the trainer and the participants are tired, they're frustrated, and they're not sure why their training was not successful. Now, I want you to just think about this for a moment. Think about the story and just type into the chat, what went wrong? What went wrong in this example? Okay, Everlyn says there was no research done on the audience. Savior, there's no connection between the trainer and the trainee. Nikki says the trainers may not know the interests or needs of the audience. Prabhu, Dr. Prabhu, that's not relevant to the audience. There's no engagement. There was no variety or belonging. Okay, Kihu, the, the trainer did not understand the context of the audience. All right, so you are definitely on to the right answer. Okay, the, 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 the trainer did not understand the audience, did not understand what the audience was expecting, what the audience needed, um, what they were hoping to get from the training. So what went, so sorry, what could the trainer have done differently? And I want you to think about this more, more, more um, about what he could have done differently before the training and not necessarily during the training. What should he have done differently that could have solved this problem? Savior says, yep, he, he should have contextualized. Good, what else could he have done differently? Gladys, he could have done some research about the audience, excellent. Yeah, thank you. We could have researched what the need was. A little bit of research, some surveys, asking the host what they needed. Good. Understanding the audience, as it says, and how best they learn. <clears throat> All right, this is really excellent. So we see in this example that the trainer made a number of assumptions regarding the training. He made the assumption that what he was really excited about the participants would be really excited about. He made the assumption that what he was learning was what the audience needed. And it would have been it benefited the trainer and it would have benefited the church if he had started the process with learning. And this is what we are going to talk about today. We're going to talk about today that it is important that we learn before we write. Um, it is important that we learn about our audience, that we learn about ourselves, that we learn about the context before we even begin training development. And if you have your workbook, um, we are on page six in our workbook with session two. And if you are a One Hope person, this will be very familiar to you. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this today, but there are more notes in your workbook. Um, but we use a process um, for all of our program development called outcome-based ministry. This is a framework that we use that helps us to pursue fruitful ministry. And it begins with discover. It begins with the process of learning. And what we have found as a training team is that this framework that we use of outcome-based ministry actually serves us really well in the training development space. And so we start with discover, we start with learning, and then we take what we have learned in that discovery space and we design or we develop our training, which is what most of our workshop sessions will be about, is designing and developing our training. And then after we design, we deploy, right? We actually do the work of training and we train participants, and then... We are. We won't talk a lot about this in our writers' workshop, but this is something that One Hope has been talking more about in the training space: is document training, and what this word "document" means. It just simply means we're going to evaluate, we're going to research whether our training is meeting the outcomes that um, we have set out to achieve through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we evaluate the training, 
And then the last D is dream, which is taking what we've learned in the document stage and then using it um, to change our training or to update it as it needs to be updated to achieve the outcomes. So while this process is, um, these five Ds are unique to one hope, um, it actually, in, when we use it in the training development space, it's very similar to a curriculum instructional design model called ADDI, A-D-D-I-E. And I'm gonna give you um, in the Dropbox later today that we send you a link to, you'll, I'll put that ADDI document in there and you'll see the steps that that is used there for instructional development. So it's very similar to what we're going to be teaching you today. And one thing that we just need to kind of do as we begin this process is just to posture our hearts. Um, and this has been a key learning for me, but just posture our hearts with humility and positioning ourselves before the Lord saying we are dependent upon you. And I'm going to read two scriptures for you this morning. And as I read them, I want you to be thinking about what do these scriptures um, how do they speak to my heart posture when it comes to training development? What does humility mean when we're writing training? But the first is from Proverbs 11, verse 2, and it says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. With humility comes wisdom. And then here um, in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 5, this is Paul when he's, in, these are the verses that come right before his beautiful description of Jesus and his humility, which we'll look at the end of our time today. But he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So on this next slide here, I'm going to invite you to find your annotate tool. If you weren't here with us last week, the annotate tool on your screen should just be a little pencil with a circle, um, either on your computer or on your phone. And I'm going to ask you to find your stamp feature. And I would like for you to stamp onto the screen the phrases that demonstrate humility as we develop training curriculum. What, what things on the screen are examples of having a posture of humility? Okay, seeing lots of great answers there. Certainly dependence upon God is a posture of humility saying the audience comes first. It's not, it's not about necessarily what I want to teach or what I want to do. I'm going to listen to the audience and they come first. That's part of honoring others above ourselves. Listening to um, serve the audience well, right? That posture, we're going to listen before we write. And then I think the last one, which shows humility, humility is I don't have all the answers, right? I don't, I don't know. We might be experts in things, but just say there's still new things that I need to learn all um, demonstrate a reliance upon God and the posture of humility. And what humility does, and we can go ahead and stop annotating and clear the screen, what humility does is that it leads us to learn. Because when we say we don't have all the answers, when we say we need to understand our audience, it moves us to discover. 
And like the trainer in the story, it can be really easy for us to make assumptions when we develop training. I know I've done this, like assumptions about what the participants need and what they want to learn and how they learn best. And we need to pause. This is what we're going to talk about today. We need to pause and learn so that we can test our assumptions before we begin writing. And so we are going today to consider three big things. We're going to look at six areas of discovery. We're going to talk then about the importance of audience. And then we'll shift a little bit. Um, and we're going to talk about adult learning principles because that is kind of a universal thing that help us to understand our audience better. So the first thing we will talk about is the six areas of discovery. And I know that when a training request first comes in, right, I want to begin writing and uh, just kind of jump right in. But there's some things that we need to learn um, before we begin. And the first one, um, and you'll see this in your workbook, the first thing that we need to learn, and if you think about, Andrea, um, I'm so glad that you did the Pictionary with the framework, because this all of what we're going to talk about today fits within that first element of fruitful training, which is the framework of our training, the bones, the things that give us the structure that we're going to write about. Um, the first thing that we want to talk about is, is there a need that training will fix? So in each one of these areas, there's going to be an area or a category and then a question that we want to answer. So the first question we want to answer is, is there a need that training will fix or that training will address? Think about the different trainings that you have in your region. Just think about one training, and it doesn't have to be one hope or one for 50. It can be, but a training that is that is used a lot in your region. And just type into the chat, what need does that training seek to address? What is that training trying to fix or to address? As you're answering, if you're having a hard time um, finding your chat box, it's because you need to click the X at the bottom of your annotate tool to bring you back to your main menu. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate that. So we have lack of skills and capacity to reach and disciple children. Nancy said the skills that are desired change the way that we teach, Prabhu says. We are equipping church leaders in person uh, communication. There's a discipleship need. Okay. So we're seeing some some pretty broad needs. Oh, to live in harmony. Thank you, Diana. So as I was thinking about this, um, thank you everyone for sharing. I was thinking about um, trauma training, One Hope and One for 50 developed. Um, this was developed out of a need, a request from leaders on the field, especially during COVID that said, we, we need some help. Um, we have children that are experiencing trauma. We, we're not sure what to do and how to minister to them. And so this training, the training couldn't meet every need, right? It couldn't address every issue that churches were experiencing regarding children and trauma, but it was meant to equip um, with some basic skills and understanding around trauma, which met a need in the local church. The one for 5012 was actually created, the first versions of that were created almost 20 years ago. Maybe that's a little bit too long, but though that training was developed because at that point, very few churches globally had received any children's ministry training and leaders from around the world had identified seven key areas that said, this is the kind of, this is what's needed to help children build a lasting relationship with Jesus. And so the 12 was written to address those needs. Now, so we do need to recognize, and this is why we ask the question, sometimes training can't fix a need, right? Sometimes training only can address a portion of a need that a church has or that a ministry has. Um, sometimes we try to ask training to do too much, which is why we're asking the question, what is 
the need. So that's the first one. And we actually will talk more about this as we go through our adult learning principles. The second area are outcomes. And we're going to spend a whole session on this next time. So we won't spend a lot of time on this today. But before we begin writing, we need to answer the question, what do we want participants to know and do as a result of the training? We have to identify outcomes before we begin developing our training. The next one is one that I actually don't think we talk about really enough, but it's going to be really important um, that we know this. The third area is our value or our values. How do our values relate to this topic? And, and it almost shouldn't say our, it should really say, um, how do our, how does our ministry values relate to this topic or our church's values or whoever we're developing the training for? Sometimes this is, can be really obvious um, in terms of what our church or our ministry or, you know, if we're talking about one for 50, what, what we value. Um, but sometimes with some newer topics regarding maybe mental health in children, maybe sexuality or gender identity or technology, um, we need to understand how are the ministry that we're writing for or the movement that we're writing for or our denomination that we're writing for thinks about these things. We might have our own values and thinking in this area, but what does one hope think? What is our stance about some of these things that we're going to be writing on? So if you're not sure, where would you go? You can type your response into the chat. When you're developing a training and you're not sure what your ministry or your denomination or one for 50 thinks about a particular thing, where would you go to discover this? All right, to the Bible, to God's word. All right, Britt says to leadership. We're going to check out the website of the organization. Statement of beliefs, good. The mission statement. Thank you, Nancy. Certainly, we want to go to the scriptures first. Andrew says the core value statements or the organizational DNA, the vision of the organization. Absolutely. I would recommend, yes, the Bible first. And if you're not sure, talk to your leadership. So for one for 50, go to the leadership team and have them um, share we think about this particular issue? How do we want to talk about this particular issue in our training? If it's one hope, we got lots of white papers that have been written. We can, um, that have been reviewed by our leadership. We can talk to our GVPs. We can talk to our theologians um, to have um, just an understanding of how we want to talk about these issues that we are um, developing our training on. The fourth category is our delivery method. So before we want to, we write our training, we need to know how is our training going to be delivered? What delivery method will we choose for the training? So as you think about training, um, it used to be years ago that the only option that we had for training was in-person training, face-to-face being in the same room with one another. But now we have more options than that. So what are some of the delivery methods that we have to choose from um, in terms of how training can be delivered today? And again, you can type your responses into the chat. All right, we've got social media can be a place where we deliver training. Good. Thank you, Christian. Videos. Britt says online course. We have in-person, online, Zoom. Excellent. Lots of different choices uh, today and still including our live training, our in-person training. Yeah. Israel says we have WhatsApp. We can do micro video trainings. Um, lots of innovation has taken place in the area of training. Now, just so that you know, um, in our writer's workshop, uh, the skills that we're learning can be applied, I think, to any of these 
um, delivery methods, but we're going to focus specifically over our, our 10 weeks together on in-person or Zoom training development because videos and online courses, they do require a little bit of a different thinking. But I want us to just pause for a moment and you can get your annotate tool back out there with your pencil. And I want you uh, to consider what are some of the things that will impact how you choose your training delivery method? And you can use your star or your check, but on the screen we have technology, which is like access to technology for participants, the schedule of participants, the participants learning style, the um, preferred teaching style of the trainer, the training topic, and then even your budget, your finances. Just check or stamp all of the things that will impact what training delivery method you choose. So they're saying lots for technology, lots for participant schedules, preferred learning style. We have some for preferred teaching style, training topic, finances. All right. So part of what I wanted to do here was just help us to see that even with each of these categories, or these areas, there's going to be some things underneath that that we're going to have to think about before we can answer that bigger question. And I'm also going to say that if we go back to the beginning and we think about humility and we think about putting participants first, what will impact this decision most are technology, their schedules, their preferred learning style, the topic of the training, because sometimes the topic is best done in person or is best done on Zoom. Probably finances, if you don't have the ability to travel or participants can't gather in one space. But the thing that should probably take the least, should influence this decision the least, is our preferred teaching style. Now that's hard for us, right? Because as trainers, we have a preferred style that we wanna teach. Maybe we want to teach in person and that's what we prefer. But if everything else says we should teach on Zoom because that's what's best for our audience, then that's the method that we should choose. If we prefer because our skill set and our love and our passion is micro training and doing small videos, but if everything else says no, oh, in-person training would be best for this, then that's what we should choose. So we do have to just consider what our audience, how they're best going to be served in this. Thank you, Andrea. And not how we want to train. And that's really hard um, for us, but it is something to consider. All right, let's go now to time. Our next category, number five, is time. How much time do we have for the training? This is really important before we begin writing training because it makes a big difference whether we're going to have a 30-minute lesson or a two-day training. Like That makes a big difference in how we approach training development. So similar to training delivery method, you can... X out of your annotate tool and type in the chat, what are the things that impact how much time you will allot for training? How do you decide whether your training is going to be an hour or a half day or three days or five days? How do you make those decisions? The availability of the audience, Israel says, let's see, and their schedule, the outcomes content. All right, Edmund, how much content do you have to deal with? What's the timing of the audience? The amount of content, the content, the activities, the outcome, the availability of participants. All right, Rubab, you've got, I mean, if you look at all of these, thank you, Martha, we haven't even talked about language. All of these matter. The cost matters, availability matters, content matters, location matters. We have to think about all of them and then hold them in tension 
And really sometimes it's just asking the Holy Spirit, like help us to know, um, because we have content that we can fill for three days, but our participants have really full schedules. They can't come to a three-day training. What do we do? But we have to consider all of those things before we can even answer the question of how much time are we going to give to our training? And just so you know, we're going to talk more about how we consider all of these things and hold them in tension next week. But this is just to like get us to start thinking in that space that all of these things work together. We have to consider all of them before we even begin developing our training. And this last one is audience. Who are we designing the training for? And we're gonna, this, this category is so big that we're gonna spend a whole section on this in just a moment because this is probably the most important um, one that we want to consider because it will affect um, so many things. Now, before we talk more about the audience, we're going to do this activity and I have no idea if this is going to work. So um, let's <laughs> listen to my instructions. Okay. So we have our six areas here, six boxes with our icons that represent them. What I want to try to do is work together. So all of us working together to make sure that in each box, we have the area that that icon represents and the question that we want to make sure that we answer. So if you see that the box is already filled, maybe go to another box. Um, but I want you to use your text annotate tool, which is that little T that you see. That'll give you a text box that you can type in. And you can use your, your workbook notes. But let's see if we can populate or, or put in each of these six boxes the need and then the question, and you can go ahead and start. And if it's a little bit messy, then it's a little bit messy and we're gonna be okay with that. All right, good. I see delivery method is there. Good. Got the time, how much time? Excellent. I see values. All right, outcomes. All right, we've got people or the audience. What do we want participants to know and do as a result of the training? Good for outcomes. All right. Excellent. I'm going to ask you to pause your annotation for just a moment. So we have need. Is there a need that training will fix? That was the first one. Then we have outcomes. What do we want participants to know and be able to do? Our values, right? How do our values relate to the topic? Delivery method, what delivery method will we choose? Time, how much time do we have for the training? And then our audience, who are we designing the training for? Now, here we go. We're gonna practice our Zoom skills, our annotate skills. Now I want you to find your stamp tool. And I want you to stamp which one of these areas do you need to pay more attention to in the discovery process? Like which one of these areas are you like, oh, I really haven't thought enough about this in the past. And I need to think more about this as I move forward. Good, thank you everyone for, for sharing. And as you can see, we each have different things, right? That maybe we thought really well about this part in the past, but now, um, we're going, oh, I, I need to think more about need, or I need to think more about outcomes, or I need to think more about values or delivery method. Excellent. So we are actually going in our workshop. We're going to be talking about each one of these things, um, not today, but as we go on um, and considering how we make these decisions um, as we develop training. But we are going to move on now to understanding the importance of audience. So I want to define audience really quickly. Um, our audience are the people that are going to be receiving the training. So that might be children's ministry leaders or pastors or youth ministry leaders or denominational reader, leaders. It's the people who receive the training. The reason why this gets a little bit tricky is because when we are writing 
the training manual, we need to write the manual in a way that the person who is doing the training can teach the information. And we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks. So, but we are not writing for the trainer. We are writing for the people who are going to be receiving the training. That is our audience. And I've already pretty much given you the answer to that question. So we're not going to answer it together. But the audience informs so many different parts of our training. Understanding the audience will inform our outcomes. It'll inform how we choose content. It will inform the types of learning activities that we choose. It's going to inform the examples and the stories that we use. As we already said, it's going to inform the length of our training. And it's going to inform our training delivery method. Our audience basically is going to inform every aspect of our training. Every part of what we do in training and how we develop training is going to be informed by our audience, which means that the better we understand our audience and their context and who they are and their roles and what they need, the better our training is going to be. And what I love is that we see this in the teaching and the example of Jesus. Like, let's just pause for a minute and just marvel at how masterful a teacher Jesus was. He taught with authority. He taught with purpose. He taught with truth. And he also taught with a very real understanding of who he was talking to and how to communicate truth in the best ways to them. So in the chat real um, quickly, we certainly can't do all of, look at exhaustive ways that Jesus taught, but in the chat, how did Jesus teach in a way that kept his audience in mind? What are some of the things that Jesus did? He used parables, thank you, Jezza, stories that related. He did demonstrations. He contextualized his examples. He used questions. He used stories. He used practical examples and teachable moments and relative examples. Yes, Jesus did so many things, right? And you can continue to type your answers into the chat. He used everyday objects, right? And locations. He you know, used the seed and he used the fig tree and he talked about fish and he talked about the farmer. He shared familiar stories and characters. You think about the parable of the good Samaritan and the prodigal son and, and so many things that Jesus said directly related and could be understood by the audience. He built on what they already knew. Think about the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard that it was said. You know, he's, he's drawing their attention to what they already know. And then he's saying, but I tell you, I'm going to tell you something new that builds on this. And Jesus knew their pain points. He knew what they needed to hear, not what they wanted to hear, but what they needed to hear. As you look at those conversations that Jesus had with Nicodemus, with the Samaritan woman, with the rich young ruler, he talked to them and communicated with them in ways that they needed to hear. And so when we think about our audience, we want to think about all of these different things as we learn about them, their role, their context. And when I say role, what do they do? Are they pastors? Are they children's ministry leaders? Are they teachers? Are they volunteers? Where are they serving? What's the context like? What's their learning style like? We're going to have a whole lesson on, on oral preference learners and how we can write training for them. What's their level of education? Are, are we talking about seminary students? Are we you know, that makes a difference in how we write. What's their need? What's their access to technology? What are their schedules like and their time that they have available? And what do they already know? What kind of training have they already received? All of, all of that makes a difference in how we develop our training. And this is actually going to be your homework. Part of your homework is going to be answering these questions about your audience. So like we did a bit a little bit earlier, we're going to wrestle together um, with how all of these things connect. 
right? Because it's one thing to know this information about our audience, and it's another thing to help it inform the decisions we make about training development, All right? So get your stamp annotate tool out. And we have four examples we're going to go through together. All right, so this first one is if my audience has limited internet access, which one of these, or it could be more than one, but which one of these options might be best? Zoom would be a good delivery method. In-person training might be best, or training in WhatsApp could also be an option. Stamp which one. So we have lots of people saying in-person training would be best. Training in WhatsApp could also be an option. That's training in WhatsApp is a little bit different, um, but we do have some some One Hope um, regions that are using this really well. And we see that nobody said Zoom would be a good delivery method. So excellent job. All right, let's go to our next one. Okay, if my audience is pastors, and let's say denominational leaders, my training should include hand motions to help them remember the points. It could be all lecture, or it should include scriptural richness. What do we think is best? And some of these right now, we might just be guessing, and that's okay because we haven't talked about this yet. But this is, I'm just giving you a little preview of what's to come and understanding our audience. All right, so if my audience is pastors and leaders, I would say the best answer here is that we want to include lots of scripture and scriptural richness in our training. Um, simply because people are pastors and leaders doesn't necessarily mean they need a lot of lecture. They might need discussion questions, they might not need themes, and they're probably not going to be interested in hand motions, um, but we can still make an engaging training for them. But again, we're starting to think like, how does my audience inform how to write training? All right, let's go to our next one. If my audience is oral preference learner, so an oral preference learner is someone who prefers to learn through hearing um, and through stories. Uh, rather than through reading. And we're going to have a whole lesson on this, but I want you to do your best. Include stories and discussion to cover as much content as possible or include reading and filling out charts. All right, I'm seeing lots of good engagement here and you are on. So if your audience is oral preference learners, you want to include lots of stories and discussion. You do not want to cover as much content as possible. Actually, we're going to learn that that's not really a good option for any audience as we as we go through this. And then um, we're also going to learn that oral preference learners do not do well with doing a lot of reading and filling out of charts. Um, and then our last one here, and we already talked a little bit about time, but if my audience works during the day, so if they work during the day, during the week, what is going to be the best way to do this? Should we hold a two-day training during the week? Should we do a 90-minute in-person training in the evenings or offer an online course? Which option or options? do we think are going to be best? So if you have an audience that is working during the day, it's probably not going to be the best option to hold a two-day training during the week. They're gonna to struggle to attend that. So we have to think, maybe I'll do a, a 90 minute training. Maybe we're gonna offer an online course. All of these, and here's what's tricky about training development. And this is why we need the Holy Spirit is because we have to consider all of these things, right? Like we're not just thinking about schedule, we're not just thinking about learning style, and we're not just thinking about their role. We're thinking about all of those things. And then considering all of those things together and saying, okay, now how does that impact the training that I'm gonna develop? How is that gonna impact the time? How is it gonna impact my learning activities? And this is why we need the Holy Spirit. And this is why we'll talk more about this next week. But it also emphasizes the 
importance of learning about our audience. Because if we simply make assumptions and we guess about these things about our audience, then we're going to make some incorrect assumptions as we design and develop our training. So here is our next question is, how do we do this? How do we learn about our audience? How do we discover these things about ourselves? And so we're going to look at just real briefly some discovery tools. And what I will tell you is that each one of these tools, actually, we could do a whole training on each one of these. And so we're going to give you some additional resources in the follow-up email that you can look at that will help you as you use these things. But one thing that you can use, and many of you had already mentioned this, is doing some research with your audience. This could be doing some interviews or just having some conversations with members of your target audience. You might do surveys, um, which is just a simple questionnaire that you send out. You could even do a focus group, which is just gathering different representatives of your audience and having a conversation with them so that you can learn about their needs, about their, about how they prefer to learn, about what are some of the challenges that they're facing in ministry. All of those things will help to inform how you develop your training. We also have for you um, in your workbook, a sample intake form. This intake form covers some of the things that as we as One Hope, as we're thinking about training, these are some of the questions that we're asking um, as we do our own discovery process. You can certainly change this and update this as, as you need to for your region. Maybe there are questions that we don't have that you want to add. Um, but this is just to give you an example of before I write my training, I should know these things and I should have these things answered. Another helpful thing that you could do is, is you could fill out an empathy map, right, for your audience. And again, I'll, I'll send a video that explains how to do an empathy map. You have an example in your workbook. But an empathy map is simply saying, okay, this is my audience and I am going to answer these questions. What are, what are they thinking and feeling in their daily life, in their ministry? What are their beliefs? What are the things that they're afraid of? What do they say and do? What do they see and hear? You're, it's like you're putting yourself um, in their position, seeing the world the way that they see the world. That's kind of what an empathy map does. And it just gives us a picture of who they are so that we can go to our training and say, oh, if this is what my audience is facing and their frustrations and challenges and what they need and what they want, this will help me to develop my training, keeping them in mind. So we're going to give you a few moments. Um, we're going to divide you into breakout rooms. And in your breakout room, this is what I would like for you to do. But I'd love for you to talk together which of these tools have you used and found most helpful in your training discovery process? So research, the intake form, and empathy map, have you used them? And which have you found to be most helpful? And then the second question is, what else have you done? Or maybe some ideas for what you could do in this discovery stage that would be beneficial for others to know about that you could share in your group. Okay, Israel says, exploring new topics, finding the relevant information, generating creative concepts, identifying potential solutions to problems, good. All right, Dr. Prabhu, the, the empathy form, good. The survey, um, the interview, well, Gladys, observing research. Yeah, empathy map, asking questions, doing a pre-visit. I love that doing, you know, that pre-visit, pre-research, kind of collecting all of that information in a Google Doc. All right. Jezza says we did a pilot. Oh, that's Zoom kind of puts the answers in before I'm I'm done. We did a pilot for a certain topic and after the forum we asked for feedback. That's excellent. Um, the survey's been helpful. 
Rubab says, um, finding the connecting person, right, of peace is also helpful. That That's really good. Finding a person who can help you, um, who's the person of peace in a community who can give you some insight. Yeah, thank you. So Jonathan says the informal interviews. So sometimes, yes, yeah, so just having an informal conversation with leaders helps us to see their needs. Speaking with pastors, showing the material that you plan to use and getting some feedback, that's really excellent. Surveys and interviews. All right, flyers that show the content, intake. I'm going to encourage you all to just look through these. These are excellent. Again, in Prabhu's group, you know, just observations of culture and context, which you know, for those of you who are living in those contexts and cultures is, can be easy for, for some of us who write for context that we don't live in, we really need to work a little bit harder in that discovery space because um, we don't know and we, we're not in the country to observe, but that's really good. Oh, I love this answer. Partner organizations have worked in certain areas can connect us to the audience where a specific training is, is needed. That's a really great answer. So also looking for who else is working in that region, who are people, who are partners that we can talk to, who have a deeper understanding of that audience. This is really well done, everyone. Um, thank you for these fruitful discussions. Um, another thing that I can do here, if I remember, I'll save the chat and we can actually put, take some of these answers and also include them in a document that you can have if you're not able to capture all of them now. I'm going to say one more thing and then we're going to go on our break. As you can see, hopefully, this is something that I've had to learn is that discovery takes time, right? So if you need to write your training next week and you're doing discovery this week, <laughs> um, we probably haven't built in enough time for discovery. So as you're thinking about your timeline for training development, um, and this will be a little bit different in the writer's workshop because we will only take a week for discovery, but we need to make sure that we are building in time in our timeline to do um, discovery and to do it well. That doesn't mean we need to spend six months in interview process, or, but we do need to make sure that we are building in enough time so that we can gather enough information um, to serve our audience well. We're gonna move on now and we're gonna talk about adult learning principles. The reason why we're putting this here in a discussion about audience is because for most of us, our audience will be adults. We may have teens or um, sometimes in our training, but we want to share with you some principles about adult learning. And, and then we're going to kind of throughout our workshop sessions, we'll kind of keep coming back to these and pointing back to how these principles help to shape how we write training. But adult learning principles, this is really the, the science and the art of teaching adults, because adults learn differently than children. And you'll see in your workbook at the end of this section, I gave you a number, I think maybe three links to different websites. There's lots of adult learning theories and principles. Um, I'm only going to share four with you today, but you can certainly learn more on your own about how these principles work and how they can shape our training. But I think it's important for us when we're, because many of us are writing training for people that are going to work with children and adults and sorry, children and, and youth. However, the people that we're training are adults and they learn differently than children do. So on your screen, before we share the first principle, I want you to think about this and I get your annotate tool ready. I want you to remember the last time that you were in a training or you were attending a presentation. And at some point you realized this training, this presentation, it's not relevant to me. Like this, this information has no value to me. It's not important to my situation and my context. I want you to use your annotate tool and just check off what are some things that happened to you or how did this realization affect you? So when you realize a presentation isn't going to have value for you, do you leave? Do you watch videos on your phone? Are you like me and you start checking your email, right? You lose energy. 
you're thinking, oh, this is this is a waste of my time. What are some things that happen when you realize? All right, so we're seeing a lot of, yep, I'm watching videos. I'm being real honest, I'm watching videos on my phone. Zoom makes it really easy to leave, right? If you're doing a presentation on Zoom, like just, oh, I'm ending and nobody really knows that I'm gone. You're multitasking. All right, so I just want you to look at this for a moment because very few of you say, I'm still listening well. Some of you, good job, you're still staying engaged. But I think for most of us, we, in our minds, we just check out of that presentation and we're doing other things. And all of this leads us to our first adult learning principle, which is adults care about significance and relevance. Adults must understand why they need to learn something. Because without understanding why something is important or why that learning is relevant, adults, as we've just seen, are going to quickly lose interest and disengage. So I want you uh, to just think about this and answer in the chat. How should caring about relevance impact our training development? So if adults care about significance and relevance, how should that impact how we develop training? And you can um, close out of your annotate tool, click that little red X and type your responses into the chat. Andrea says we should be solving a problem for them. Israel, prepare content that's a direct need for their audience. We need to understand their need. Training should be engaging, absolutely, Savior. Then we should we should find out what they need. All right, good. You're all grappling with this. So I think that yes, training should absolutely be engaging. But even if training is really engaging, but it's not on a topic that's relevant to our audience, they might stay engaged, but they're probably not going to use what they've learned. And we're going to find out why in just a moment. But many of you said, we need to write about something that they need. We need to help them solve problems that they have in their ministry. So I'm gonna share two things with you that I think are important. And, and we kind of need to hold these things in tension. So the first thing is that we need to choose topics that have value for our audience. So we've talked about this already, but sometimes we want to do a training on something that's important to us right? It has value to us. And so we think it must have value to everyone. And sometimes that's true. But when we understand our audience and do discovery, we learn what has value to them. What are the challenges that they are facing? And so we want to write on topics that um, meet a need that the audience has. Here's the tension that we live in. The tension is that sometimes an audience doesn't always know what they need or they have a need, but then underneath that is something that they don't even know that they need, right? Because we don't know what we don't know. So sometimes in our training, what we have to do is we have to give them what they need. And then we also have to um, maybe give them something underneath that need. And I know that doesn't really make sense right now, but it will a few weeks from now, um, but we might have to do some advocacy for our topic at the beginning of the training. That might be looking at the scripture or looking at research or helping our audience to see why this topic is important or why it's relevant. It might be that a church requests a training on how to teach Bible stories to children, right? That's a need that their leaders have that they need to they, they want some more training on how to do that well. We might say, well, in order to teach Bible stories well to children, the audience needs to understand that the Bible teaches one big story. It's, it teaches, you know, the story about, about God's great love for us through Jesus. The audience might not know that they need that. So we've got to help them see that need. And then we also need to address the real practical need that's in front of them. 
So here's our second learning principle. And I, if this feels like we're going through this quickly, I just want to assure you that this is really laying the foundation for many of the things that we'll talk about later in terms of content development, in terms of um, writing introductions, writing action steps, all of those things. We're going to unpack this um, as we go throughout our time together. The second adult learning principle is that adults use their life experience to facilitate learning. So think about this. Children don't have a lot of life experience, um, but adults come to our training with lots of life experience. Some of that experience and knowledge might be in the topic that we're training, but adults will learn better if their experiences and their knowledge are drawn upon in the learning experience. And we're gonna learn that this is especially true for oral preference learners in a few weeks. So how do we use and incorporate our participants' knowledge and experience? And as I go through these, I want you to be thinking about how have we already, how have we been demonstrating this in the writer's workshop? Because I'm gonna ask you in just a moment. So the first one is giving participants opportunities to share. Right, we're asking discussion questions and we're asking participants to share from their own experience and their own knowledge. The second is we're asking participants to think about an experience that they have had. So um, I think about this from the trauma training. One of the um, questions that we we did this a lot in the trauma training, but it, you know we asked them to think about think about a time when you experienced a trauma. What happened in your mind? What happened in your body? What happened in your emotions? We're drawing upon um, a real life experience of our participants. And then the last one is providing real life examples and the scenarios in our training. Um, we're using stories, we're using examples. So I know we're coming to the end of our training and I'm really gonna kind of push us to, <laughs> to think and to connect here. I want you to get your annotate tool, your little, the text tool with the T. And I want you to think about and type into each of these columns, examples from what we have already done today. How have I, and maybe I haven't, but how have I modeled this? So when have I given you opportunities to share? What were some of those opportunities? When have I asked you to think about your personal experience and to connect what we're learning to that experience? And what about real life examples and scenarios? What have I done for that? And real life doesn't necessarily mean it's a real true story. Real life simply means that it's a, a story that we all could relate to or an example that might actually happen in real life. If you ever want to be sure that you're being intentional about how you develop your training, do an activity like this so that your um, participants, it really makes you think about, am I actually including this in my training? So I have given you some opportunities to share in how you've done um, research, uh, the feedback in your breakout rooms, you know, just some of the discussion questions that we have had in the chat, using the chat for answers. I've asked you to think about your personal experiences. Again, that's very similar with the breakout rooms of just how have you done this in the past? Even just what we did earlier, where I said, think about a time when you were in a presentation and you realized it wasn't engaging for you or just wasn't relevant for you, that's asking you to think about a personal experience that you had. Thinking about how you have done um, your trainings. And then we have provided some real life examples and some scenarios, right? The story from the beginning, somebody said that um, about the trainer um, is a real kind of life example. Thinking about um, Jesus um, and how he connected with his audience. So these are just some examples, and we're going to be doing this throughout our workshop where I'm going to be um, trying to model for you these 
of course, these best practices that we're talking about and then drawing our attention to them, not so we can say, oh, Karen's doing a great job. That's not why we're doing this. We're doing it so that you can see, oh, this is what it looks like in a training to incorporate these principles and these best practices that we are learning about. So good. So our second principle is we want to connect what we're teaching to our audience's experience. Now, as an introduction to our next principle, I would love for you to type into the chat and you'll have to X out of your annotate tool, type into the chat, why are you attending the writer's workshop? And this, I want you to answer honestly, right? So if your boss is making you attend the writer's workshop, you can type that in there. My boss is making me do this. I'm just, <laughs> no, we're doing this to serve you, but why are you attending? And this is a big time commitment. All right, Nancy says, I'm hungry to learn this skill. Mary says, I wanna learn how to write curriculum, to grow in my skills, right? We're learning. We want to serve leaders in the next generation. We want to be equipped. We want to grow in content. We really want to learn the skills. So, you know, you want to be a better coach. So all of these things, right? Hardly, and I don't think I saw anybody say, um, somebody's making me come here, right? We're here because we want to learn. We're here because there's a skill that we want to get better at. Um, and so we are committed to coming. And so our third learning, adult learning principle is that adults are practical and solution oriented. And this is um, ties directly into significance and relevance. But I want you to think about this for a moment. So in school, a child or a teenager, right, they're learning about a subject. They're learning about math. They're learning about science. They're learning about language, right? They're learning all of these things. And those things are not helping them learn how to be a better child or learn how to be a better teacher or a better teenager. Eventually they're going to need those skills, right? But they're kind of learning for the sake of learning. They're not necessarily going, boy, I really need algebra right now. And so I need to make sure that I master algebra. It's very different. But adults, adults are more ready to learn when there is a problem that we want to solve. So if there is an immediate problem that we want to solve, we are ready to learn about that thing. All right, so we're gonna, again, use your annotate tool. And I want you to answer honestly, this is not a, there's something on the screen, so I need to stamp it. All right, I want you to think about this. If you had free time, like your free time, fun time, I can do whatever I want. How many of you, and you can use your stamp tool, would use your free time to visit a medical website and learn about health issues? How many of you would say, you know what, I'm going to watch a video about different cell phones that are, you know, mobile phones that are available, and I'm going to learn about those things. I see it's, uh, I see some of your expressions like, I would not do that. Why are you bringing this up? And then how many of you would read a history book? I've got free time. And so I'm, I'm going to read about history. All right. Now, I'm not surprised by reading a history book. I'm very surprised. Um, and would love to talk with those of you who use your free time to watch a video about cell phones, because I think maybe you need some different hobbies. Uh, but you're being honest, so thank you for sharing that. All right, and some of you are like, yep, I'll go to a medical website, which I also find really interesting. All right, let's clear the screen. Now, I want you to think about this. Now, don't annotate yet. I want to explain what we're doing. How many of you would do those things if your child needed help with the history project. If your child needed help with the history project, would you read a book about history to help them? If you're sick and you want to know what your symptoms are or what you should do, how many of you would then go to a medical website to learn about your sickness? And then if you needed to buy 
a new cell phone or a new mobile phone, how many of you would then watch a video about cell phones? And you can go ahead and use your, probably best if you use your stamp tool. I see lots of lines on the screen, but probably better if you use your stamp tool for this. Oh, oh I see what you're doing. You're matching. Fine. If, you, if you're matching, <laughs> that's you are ahead of me. But I just want us to think about this, right? When there's a need, we go to learn about the need. So if I need to fix something that's broken in my home and I don't want to pay someone to do it, that's when I go to YouTube and I'm I'm like, who can teach me how to fix this thing? But I don't go on YouTube just learning about home improvement projects in my free time. I go when I need to learn. Sorry, this slide is, is really cracking me up at the moment. All right. But all of this should help, leads us to our next question, which is very similar to what we've talked about already. So I'm, I'm just gonna kind of maybe skip over this question. But how should this impact training development? If adults learn when they need to solve a problem, then this, these are some things that we need to do. We need to be practical and not theoretical. So this means we're bringing our training out from the out from you know the sky in the in theory and we're going to talk about this when we go to learning activities and writing content but we want to make sure that we're being grounded in practical. We want to provide opportunities to practice in the training. This is something that we've done, right? I have asked you and it's simple. Right? We're stamping on the slide, we're thinking about answers, we're like we're actually practicing the skills that we're learning in the training. So if we want to teach our, you know, participants how to contextualize the gospel for children, then we're asking them to practice that skill in the training, right? We're not just talking about it in theory. We're talking about how it would actually look when they use that skill. And then we're teaching thinking and skills that participants can immediately use and apply to their ministry context. So if we're writing something that's relevant for participants, like we know their need and we're writing on something that's relevant, this should be this should be fairly easy. It should be fairly easy to go, okay, our participants need this. And so now I'm gonna teach them something that they can immediately use. But think about how many times you've, gone to a workshop or you've gone to a conference and how you've been like, oh, this is really good information, but then you don't use it. A lot of times the reasons why we don't use it is because it's not something that we can immediately use right now in our ministry context. So I'll give you one quick example of this. The reason why we're doing homework in the writer's workshop, so you can thank the in-office training team for your homework. <laughs> so when we did this workshop, it was almost two years ago, but when we did this workshop for the in-office training team at One Hope, we had homework, but it it wasn't helpful. And some of the feedback that came back was, we're learning these great skills, but I didn't have a project that I was working, like that I was writing. I didn't have a curriculum project that I was writing on immediately. And so five months later, when I had something to write, it was really hard for me to remember what I had learned five months ago. Like it would be really good if we could practice those skills immediately. So that's why we're having homework. The homework isn't just like, we need one more thing to do. The homework is, oh, we're gonna teach a skill and then we're gonna use that skill immediately in our context. I'm not gonna ask you how we've modeled this because I've already shared some of that. And then our last, sorry, I'm reading Andrea's comment. Sorry, yeah, I did. I sold out the in-office training team, um, but I think doing the homework will be really helpful for all of us. And so the last principle is adults are self-directed learners. Adults learn better when they are active contributors to their learning and have ownership of their learning journey. Now, this is a little bit, part of this is tricky for us because for many of us, we don't have the flexibility within our, our region 
to say, okay, we have the, these three training, you know, topics, and we're going to offer th all three simultaneously, and you get to choose which one is going to work best for you. That's that's usually not that this kind of works a little bit better. Part of this works better in an online um, a training experience, like an online course where participants can go in and say, oh, I really need this and I really need this and I really need this. And then they sign up for the courses that they want to take. However, there are some things that we can do in Zoom training and in-person training to, I want to say, this is probably not the right wording, but to make participants kind of responsible for their own learning right, that facilitate them um, discovering things on their own. Um, so this is very different than lecture, because in lecture, what we're doing is, is I'm just giving you all of the information, and you're not really responsible to do anything except listen. But that's not how adults learn best. It might be how all of our institutions and educational systems are set up, I know that's, you know, how I grew up learning, you know, very lecture oriented. However, we want to give participants the opportunity to do everything on their own, to be responsible for learning things on their own. So I want you, I think this will be the last time that we use our annotate tool, but get out your annotate tool. Thank you so much for participating with that. Um, it, it's super helpful, makes training, um, just gives it more variety. But I want you to check ways or stamp ways that we can help our adult participants be responsible for their own learning in our training. Okay, seeing lots of great, uh, great interaction here. Really, the only one on the slide that's not helpful for having participants responsible for their own learning is lecturing. Now, I mean, you have noticed on our calls that there are times that I am giving you information, right? I am teaching you. I'm giving you things on the slide. Um, there are times where we have to do a little bit of teaching or a little bit of of lecture. Um, in our training. We do have to do that. How <laughs> Thank you. Somebody's putting that giant X over that. Excellent job. Um, but we want to incorporate some of these other things so that, you know, even providing handouts for note taking, like we provided you handouts. We're not asking you to take a lot of, you know, fill in the blanks, but I see that many of you are taking notes. You're being responsible for your own learning. When we ask a question and participants are discussing it or they're drawing out truth from the scripture, they're being responsible for their own learning. We're not telling them what the scripture means. They're discussing it together and learning together. When they solve a problem, when they're when they're listening to an example or story, like we did this thing, you know, rather than just me telling you, hey, sometimes we make assumptions when we're writing training. I told you the story, and then I asked you a question to think about the story. That's helping you to be responsible for your own learning, which is actually really important in adult learning. So let's go quickly. We're going to summarize this, and then we're going to talk about our homework. So we've talked about four principles for adult learning. We've talked about adults care about hints and relevance, that adults use their life experience to facilitate their learning, Adults are practical and solution oriented. And then adults are self directed learners. And I want you to type into the chat which one of these has stood out the most to you and why. Like, which one of these was maybe like a, oh, <laughs> like that makes sense. Oh, I hadn't thought about that before. Um, and just type this, that response, it doesn't have to be long, but which one has stood out to you and why? Um, Prabhu says solution oriented. All right, Ibeya, adults are self-directed learners. Thank you for sharing. Kalkadon, adults care about significance and relevance. 
Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Solution oriented, since it it just kind of puts a fire. Like if we're if we're giving them something that is going to help them solve an immediate thing that they are experiencing in their ministry, or maybe it's parents. We haven't really mentioned parents as an as an audience, but um, we are developing more training for parents. So if we know what parents are struggling with, if we know what they need, our training will will have a bigger impact. Yeah, thank you everybody um, for sharing all of these great responses. So as we close our time together, um, I want to go over your homework, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a few things. So there will be some follow up communication for you, and in that follow up communication, I'm gonna give you all of these instructions again for your homework. If you if you miss something, don't worry, it'll be it'll be written down for you. And I also want to tell you and. For those of you who have worked with me, you know that this happens to me sometimes that um, I make a decision like three weeks ago about what we were going to do. And then I changed my mind as I looked at it because I thought, oh, this will be a better way. So the homework that you have listed in your workbook is going to be a little bit different this week and next week than what I'm actually going to give you. So I want you to follow the instructions that are going to be I'm giving you now and in your email and just kind of ignore what's in your workbook. So the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do is that I want you to fill out the discovery form and I'm going to show you what the form is and where you can find it in just a moment. And then the second thing I want you to do is to talk to somebody from your audience, at least one person, to ensure that your answers to the discovery form are accurate, right? So it goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning. We don't simply want to make assumptions we want to be sure that what we're putting down for our answers and discovery are really what um, our audience needs. So this means that we need to know our who our audience is. And I'm not, again, we only have a week for this, so I'm not going to ask you to, you know, interview 10 people or put together a survey. You can do as much or as little as you want, but I would like you to at least talk to one person to make sure that you are um having accurate information. Now I'm going to see if I can do this. Let's see if this will work. I think I'm in the wrong document, but I can get to the right one. Can someone give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Are you seeing the writer's workshop homework on my screen? All right. I see a thumbs up. So in the follow-up email, you are going to get a link that will take you to this Google folder in Google Docs. It is the writer's workshop homework. We have tried to organize this in a way that makes it really easy for everybody to find what you need. So if you signed up as someone um, who is uh, active in One for 50 or you were invited by a One for 50 leader, your folder is going to be in One for 50. If you are a One Hope leader or staff member, or you invited by someone from One Hope, you will be in the One Hope folder. All right, so I'm gonna click on this folder. So you click on your folder. All right, and then we have, this is how One for 50 has organized your folder. So if you are in the West Africa region, you're gonna click on West Africa. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? Asia, if you're the support team, you're gonna be in here. So I'm gonna click, let's click on West Africa. Once you click on West Africa, all of your names are in here. You each have your own folder. So you're just gonna click on, uh, let's click on Wisdom's folder. You're gonna click on your folder and in there is your homework, right? Here's what I want you to do. It's a simple discovery form. There are 10 questions and they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, if you're not sure, you can just write not sure, but try to find the answer. You know, what's their access to technology? What training method are they going to prefer? You can highlight. Um, it's just 10 questions. Okay. Now, I kind of forgot to put in here um, a place for your name. It would be great if you put your name at the top of the document. If you are working with a team, I tried to get some information in the survey. <laughs> Let me tell you a funny thing about the survey. So some of you said, I'm gonna write with a team and you listed those people's names. And then the people that you listed said, 
I'm going to work on my own. <laughs> so I'm going to let you discover on your own this week who, you, you know, please make a decision. Who are you going to work with? Talk to those people to make sure you all know you're working together. And then just choose one of your folders. All right. So if I'm just going to pick some people. So if Andrea and Shay and Britt all work together, choose one of your folders and just work in that document and put your names at the top so we know that you're working together. That will help us. All right. Does that make sense? I'll give you some more directions. Um, and I'm going to go back and share just a few really important kinds of things as we think about the homework and then we'll pray. I will send you my, my information in the follow-up communication. So if you can't find your name or you can't find your folder or you know, something has happened, you can just reach out to me on WhatsApp and I'll, I'll direct you to where you need to go. But I want you to remember these important things. Oops, wait, where's my... Please access only your own folder or the folder of the team that you're working with. So because of the permissions, the only way to do this without it being a really big headache for everyone was to give permission for you to access the folders. This is not as much about privacy as it is about... If you're in someone else's folder, the easier it will be for you to maybe delete something that they've done or, you know, and so we're just going to ask you to stay within your own folder. Um, you can download documents from Google Docs. So if you want those documents on your own computer, that's fine. We're going to ask you that you don't delete anything. Um, again, just to make sure that we're not like waking up one day and someone's actually you know, deleted everybody's homework. Like that would be um, not cool. I'm gonna um, go in there periodically and make backup copies, but just do your, you know, best to not delete anything. And then I already mentioned about um, my name and making sure that you can reach out. You can also reach out to Jonathan Stone on the one for 50 side. Um, so for one for 50 people, um, they're going to ask that you complete your homework, I believe, by Sunday. That will be in a follow-up communication with you. For One Hope Friends, um, I'm going to ask you to complete it by Tuesday, and then I'm going to do my best to review them before we start our time together on Wednesday. You're only doing this discovery form right now. I'm not going to ask you to choose your topic yet until we get to next week. Thank you so much. Um, this is going to be a good journey together, a fun journey together. I am going to close us in prayer. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much um, for all that we have learned, for all that you are doing in us. Um, God, there is always more to learn. And I thank you for just the amazing example of Jesus and his humility. Um, that we can follow, Lord, that just considers others um, and their needs above our own needs. And so as we do this process of discovery, Lord, would you help us to have that posture of humility? Would you help us, Lord, to um, to say, yeah, this is these are the assumptions that I'm making, but, but if they're not right, I, I want to know that. If this isn't the right direction, I want to, I want to know that, Lord. Help us to be open to um, your leading. Help us to be open to hear um, from the men and women who are on the front lines of raising children as parents, of teaching children, of rescuing and rooting and releasing children for ministry all around the world. Lord, we want to serve them well, and we want to do that, Lord, um, in a way that bears fruit for your kingdom. So even in this, Lord, we invite you, we invite your Holy Spirit to work um, in this discovery process as we take this next step of developing training. Um, bless each of my dear friends today, Lord. Uh, may they know just how deeply loved they are by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day.